Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at It Follows, a delightful little indie horror film that came out in 2014. It Follows is one of my favorite horror films of the past decade, and it's only partly because it was shot and takes place in Detroit and the surrounding suburbs, which is the area where both Chelsea and I grew up. In fact, the main character's house is literally in Chelsea's neighborhood. It's crazy. Hi, Chelsea! But even if this movie wasn't pure Michigan, I'd still love it because of how satisfyingly cerebral it is. The unique premise can be interpreted a bunch of different ways, and the young cast is impressively natural in their acting. Plus, although you won't be able to tell from the kill count, the electronic score by musician Disasterpiece is fucking dope. I've been listening to it non-stop. It sounds like it was made by a corrupted LCD sound system. For that and many other reasons, I highly recommend you actually watch this movie if you haven't seen it before. It's a perfectly beautiful nightmare. In It Follows, a girl named Jay, played by Micah Monroe, contracts a sexually transmitted shape-shifting stalker. It assiduously follows her and will kill her if it ever catches her, and the only way she can pass it on is by sleeping with someone else. That new person would then be followed instead, but if the monster ever killed them, it would return to its pursuit of the previous person on the list. It's an interesting conceit that can be read as a warning about STDs, or a celebration of sex as an escape from death's relentlessness. And although there are rules to the creature's behavior, the movie is more interested in themes and atmosphere than trying to solve the monster's origin story or over-explaining it. What's following them? It is. It is bad. That's all we need to know. How many kills will it get after all that following? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins on a suburban street in Metro Detroit. An awesomely fluid long one take shows a girl named Annie in a panic, looking terrified at something behind her, but thankfully still able to run in heels like she's the operations manager of a dinosaur park. Eventually, she drives off to sit on a beach by herself at night, and come morning, why, she's the first one on the kill count, having been completely mangled by an unknown force that will come to, uh, kinda know. Start getting comfortable with not knowing things, though. With the tone-setting opening kill out of the way, we're ready to meet our heroine Jay, who enjoys swimming in her above-ground pool and getting ready for dates by tulip lights. Tulip lights? Her date is with this dude named Hugh at the historic Redford Theater in Detroit, which is where The Evil Dead had its premiere in 1981. They play a game where they talk about strangers and pick who they would trade places with. Who'd you pick? Him. The dad? Oh, uh, son. I mean, how cool would that be to have your whole life out of you, you know? before filling into the theater and jamming out to the live organ show. While continuing their game, Hugh points out a girl in a yellow dress that Jay simply fails to see. Right there. That's here. Right there. Her inability to eye spy with her little eye freaks Hugh the fuck out, and he leaves the theater in a hurry. Aw, y'all are gonna miss Charade. It's Grant and Hepburn. The next night, they try a do-over date that involves some coastal knee caressing and a steamy backseat makeout sesh in Hugh's car, parked outside the abandoned Northville Psychiatric Hospital off of Seven Mile. They end up having sex, and afterward, Hugh skips out on the pillow talk in favor of a chloroform rag that renders Jay unconscious. Uh, better after than before? before the act, I guess? She wakes up tied to a chair inside the big abandoned building in shots that could be found in an urban explorer's portfolio. Hugh drops a truth bomb on Jay and tells her that apparently there's now a nebulous thing that's going to follow her always. Somebody gave it to me, and I passed it to you back in the car. He says that the thing could appear as someone she knows or as a complete stranger, like this naked lady they see coming towards them now. The only way to escape it is by sleeping with someone else, who will then be followed by the monster instead. At least until it kills them, then it's back on up the list. If it kills you, it'll come after me. The entity's relentlessness to get closer to its potential victim is truly a thing of terror that drives this entire film and fills every scene with paranoia. We get a few other rules from Q, like that it travels in a straight line and that it's slow but not dumb, but those might not even be fully accurate, since writer-director David Robert Mitchell has said that they're just what Hugh has been able to figure out for himself. And shit, that dude ain't omniscient. Hugh drops Jay off at her house in a humiliating way that evokes the film's themes of 
sex and sexual assault. Jay might not have been raped in the traditional sense, but man, did Hugh violate her. A short trip to the hospital and an earnest investigation by the police both end up yielding no useful information. Jay doesn't have VD or anything, and Hugh has disappeared, having used a fake name this whole time. Jay starts college and takes Halloween 101, where there's always a distraction waiting for you outside the window. But it's not Mikey Myers Jay sees out there, it's an old woman in a hospital gown walking straight towards her with an intense single-mindedness. Jay leaves class and is followed through the halls by the same blank-faced figure, who nobody else seems to see. Hello? Hello? She runs away from school and goes to an ice cream parlor to get help from her sister Kelly and Kelly's friend Paul, who's got a major crush on Jay because, I mean, yeah, obviously. Jay tells them what happened to her and how she's now being followed by an it. So that night, Paul stays over on their couch to help stand guard and protect her. Also joining this slumber party is Kelly's friend Yara, this girl who has a clamshell Kindle that she's always reading Dostoevsky from. I think that if one is faced with inevitable destruction, if a house is falling upon you, for instance, one must feel a great longing to sit down, close one's eyes, and wait. Huh, sounds like someone we know. Yara's clamshell e-reader is the most noticeable example of how this movie is intentionally anachronistic. Although there are no smartphones to be seen, she's rocking this retro-style futuristic device all the time. And although Hugh drove a brand new looking car from the 70s, Annie drove to her death on the beach in a very modern vehicle. All the mismatched technology in the movie suggests a different time period, or no time period at all. And even the season isn't set in stone. When we first meet Jay, she's in her swimming pool, but the the next day, she's walking down the street in a warm winter coat. Everything is intentionally illogical, adding to the surreal, dreamlike tone of this nightmare that's perfectly augmented by the cinematography and soundtrack. I fucking love this movie, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, how could I not? It's even got a fart joke. Hey, I have an idea. What? He <laughs> got away. <laughs> Haha, <laughs> farts are always funny. When Jay can't sleep, she comes down to the living room, surely sparking many a fantasy for poor old Paul there. But before any games of footsie can get underway, the sound of broken glass sends Paul upstairs to get the others. And while he's gone, Jay goes into the kitchen to see what came through the window. Oh shit, it's a topless lady! And she's not house trained, oh no! Jay screams and runs away from the thing and retreats to her room upstairs. She only allows Kelly and Paul inside after they plead to let them help her. Is something wrong with me? But they still don't believe her just yet. So when Yara knocks and asks to be let in, they open the door for her. See, Jay? Nothing's wrong. Oh, never mind, there's a lurch-looking motherfucker in the house. And shout out to the guy who played that awesome scare, Mike Lanier, the 7'7 seven seven former basketball player and one half of the world's tallest twins. He sadly passed away last year at the age of 48. Rest in peace, man. Jay nopes the fuck out of there and rides off on a bicycle all the way to a nearby park. Weird time to try to skin the cat, Jay, but whatever calms you down, I guess. Her friends come and find her, and they all hug it out, but Jay is understandably super paranoid right now. <laughs> Do you see that? I do. It's... it's a person. That person is Greg, who lives across the street from Jay and Kelly, and is the kind of guy who likes to wash his own car in his own driveway. No automatic drive throughs for this red-blooded American. He wants to help Jay out, so he takes that clean car of his and drives the whole lot of them into Detroit, where we get nice drive-by shots of that beautiful fucking city and all its tragic economic misfortunes. I never lived in Detroit, but I was in its backyard, and I've bore witness to downtown's resurgence, so don't talk shit about shit you don't know. Long live the D, baby. They go to the abandoned house that the con artist formerly known as Hugh was renting under his fake name, probably for like 200 bucks a month. Inside, they find a bunch of homemade alarm systems, some made with Fago Rock and Rye cans, hell yes, that would tell him if anything was coming inside to get him. They also find some well-used porno mags. Maybe he was trying to get the monster to follow his right hand or something. They also find a picture of Hugh with a girl wearing a letter jacket of a nearby high school. So they head to that school in an effort to find the bastard and get more information out of it. Another fantastic fluid panning shot shows a figure walking towards the school as Jay and Greg consult some records in the office. And what's awesome here is that the movie doesn't feel the need to make a big deal out of it every time. Even when they get back in the car and tell the others that they learned Hugh's real name and address, we see that figure walking towards them. But a rack focus from the camera is the only bit of attention it gets. The characters never comment on it. As unsettling as the thing is, it's now just a part 
part of Jay's life. And the pervasive paranoia means they don't need to rely on jump scares or anything. I love that. Hugh, whose real name is Jeff, actually lives in a large suburban home that's quite a step up from the one he was renting in Detroit. And he lives there with his mother, who you may recognize as the nude woman approaching Jay when she saw the monster for the first time. In his parents' backyard, Hugh tells the others that he can still see the thing, even though he's not number one on its list. Oh, and by the way, why doesn't Jay just get herself out of that top spot by sleeping with someone and passing it on? Look, she could do the same thing I did. I mean, it should be easy for her if she's a girl. Any guy would be with you, just sleep with someone else and tell him to do the same thing. Maybe he'll never come back. Oh, Paul looks like he wants to be a hero. Since the thing is always walking towards Jay, slowly but surely, they head to Greg's far-off lakeside cabin, which I can only presume is up north, to buy themselves some time and figure out what to do next. This is where I started to wonder what would happen if Jay took a plane or a boat to another continent. Like, would this thing just walk across the bottom of the ocean to get to her? But since they're a bunch of teenagers, that's probably not a realistic financial option for them, so I guess it's a moot point. Greg's cabin's amenities not only include a full fully functional kitchen, but also an old revolver in a box. So Greg has Jay try some target practice, just in case that becomes a viable way to defeat this thing. While hanging out on the beach later, we get what's maybe my favorite spooky use of the evil being's mechanics. First we see Jay, Greg, Paul, and Kelly all hanging out and kicking back cans on the sand. Then we see Yara walking towards them all in the background behind Jay. But then we see Yara float into view out on the water. Oh shit, one of these Yara's a monster! And I'm guessing it's it's not the one on the pink inner tube. The awesomeness continues when we see what things look like from other people's perspectives. Since they can't see the being, they only see Jay's hair float upward as it grabs her and pulls her out of her chair. It's a great little sequence that expertly jumps back and forth between the different points of view. And unfortunately for Jay, it turns out that all that target practice was for naught, since even a well-landed shot to the thing's neck isn't enough to stop it from getting right back up and continuing to follow her. Although they lock it out of the garage, it busts a hole in the door and tries to get at them with a jump scare. That little bastard sends Jay scrambling the hell out of there and getting into Greg's car to escape. She drives off as the being continues to approach her, now appearing as a young girl. But Jay's frantic getaway is cut short by a nasty case of distracted driving that sends her off the road and onto the fast lane for the hospital. There, she wakes up to find her loved one sleeping and her arm in a cast. Hey, at least your legs still work. You're gonna need those to run, you know? To help Jay out, Greg agrees to sleep with her right there in the hospital bed. Wow really falling on your sword there, huh, Greg? Or I guess she would be the one falling on- never mind. Three days later, Greg tells Jay that he still hasn't seen the entity, although that might be because he slept with one of these ladies we see him laughing it up with here. We never find out if he did or not for sure, but that's okay. Ambiguity is just fine, people. In any case, Jay still doesn't feel safe, so she spends all her time locked up in her room and watching Greg's house across the street for signs of any its trying to follow him. Well now, who's that there, Jay? I don't think it's a Jehovah's Witness knocking at Greg's door, because those people are friendly and can tell you all about Jesus Christ without breaking your windows. Jay runs over to Greg's house and climbs through the broken window, hoping to help him. When she gets upstairs, she finds the being disguised as Greg's mom incessantly knocking at his door, pausing only long enough to stare daggers at Jay real quick. When it resumes knocking, Greg answers his door in standard teenage boy fashion. What the fuck, mom? This the fuck, son. Jay walks in to find the entity doing the nasty to Greg and killing him with some fucked up pseudo incest. Oh boy, there is a lot to read into here, and I can't even begin to do it in a kill count, man. With Greg dead, Jay is back on the thing's list in the premier position, so she drives far enough away to stay safely overnight at the Car Hood Inn. The next day, she wakes up and walks down to the beach, where she sees a trio of dude bros out on the water. Well, if it's a dude bro party, then Jay is there, and ain't no leg gonna stop her from getting in on it. At least, that's what we're left to assume, since the next time we see her, she's sadly and wetly driving back home. Did she reluctantly sleep with those dudes to buy herself some time? Again, it's ambiguous. In fact, she never tells Paul that she's passed it on, if she did, so he goes ahead and offers up his own services. I wanna help. 
Yeah, Jay, Paul will give you his noblest boner. She shoots him down quietly, and in his rejection, he gets an idea from a picture of Jess at a city pool. They load into a car to head there with their plan, and they'd better step on it, cause Jay sees the monster again, and it's naked Santa Claus. Okay, up on the rooftop, dick dick dick. As the kids walk past gorgeous old Detroit homes, Yara talks about the very stark border between the city and its suburbs. When I was a little girl, my parents wouldn't allow me to go south of 8 Mile. And I didn't even know what that meant until I got a little older and I started realizing that that's where the city started and the suburbs ended. <laughs> yeah, dude. 8 Mile's not just an Eminem song slash movie. It's a road with extreme divisions of race and socioeconomic status on either side, with Detroit south of it and the suburban counties of Macomb and Oakland north. And I think that little Michigan factoid deserves an awesome bit of score. What do you say? Fuck yeah! Thanks, Disaster Bees. They get to the pool and prepare for the monster by setting up a bunch of electronics around the perimeter, all plugged into extension cables. I guess they're looking to zap this monster and write it off with a death note. Jess gets into the middle of the pool while the rest of them sit around and wait by twiddling their thumbs and reading from their clamshell Kindles. Eventually, the monster arrives, but even when Jay sees him, the audience is left in the dark for a little bit. Oh my god! just walked in the room, it's right there. Probably because of whatever shape Jay sees it taking. What do you see? I don't want to tell you. Is it Gary Busey? I bet it's Gary Busey. The possibly Gary Busey looking monster starts throwing the electronics into the pool at Jay. He's gonna get electrocuted! Uh, yeah, what'd you think was gonna happen, you idiots? This climactic sequence in the pool is the one thing that keeps It Follows from being perfect, in my opinion. Maybe I'd excuse the idiocy of this electronics plan if the monster was Gary Busey, but it's not. It's just a beardo in his underwear. Paul shoots at the monster as it keeps chucking shit at Jay, but he only winds up hitting Yara in the leg by accident. It's not until Kelly gives the monster a kick-ass sheet ghost costume that Paul is finally able to shoot it in the head and knock it into the pool. It grabs grabs onto Jay's ankle before she manages to get out, and Paul takes some very risky shots to try to save her. Wow, dude, maybe ask Yara how your aim is before you try that. He eventually lands a lucky headshot that gets the monster to let her go. And although Jay has a red hand mark around her ankle, it looks like the creature is in far worse condition. It's blood filling the pool in a gnarly way that only Jay can see. With the monster apparently vanquished, Jay and Paul have some rainy celebratory blanket sex. Although afterwards, they both admit that neither of them feel any different. Paul then cruises the streets for sex workers to use as insurance to keep his name off the top of the list. Although, as you've probably guessed by now, we don't know for sure if he ever follows through with that idea. Some thematic loose ends are tied up when we see from a family picture that the monster's last shape was Jay and Kelly's late father, lending that pool scene some retrospective emotional weight. And to really put a point on it all, Yara reads one last relevant quote from Dostoevsky's The Idiot. And the most terrible agony, knowing for certain, your soul will leave your body and you will no longer be a person. And that, this is certain, the worst thing is that it is certain. The movie ends with Jay and Paul walking down the street holding hands. They're not quite happy, because how could they be, never knowing if they're fully safe or not? And judging by that person walking towards them way in the background, they might already be back on the chopping block. How many people did this invisible, versatile sex monster murder? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Only two people died in It Follows, tying it for the movie with the least kills on the kill count. With one male and one female victim, we got ourselves a very even pie chart, and with a runtime of 100 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 50 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Annie. It's the punctuation to a real kick-ass opening sequence, and she kept her high heel on the whole time. That's a classy death ride, yeah. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Greg by default, although I can safely say I've never seen a kill like that one before. And that's it, Follows, which came out in 2014, and like I said, I really friggin' enjoyed. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this extra Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Caleb Rhodes, Ezri Cassidy, Alexis Parmentier, Brian M. Cole, Cynthia Zhang, and Noah Owens. A little peek behind the curtain for production stuff, I filmed Jaws 3 and 4 at the same time before I got this haircut. So on Friday, you'll see me with my old hair, and then next Sunday, we'll be back to this. You don't really care, it's fine. Thanks everyone, be good people.